so welcome, welcome to our panel discussion on, on um, the apparent decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization and the possible implications of that decision. So in Dobbs, uh, the court heard, uh, as we know, Mississippi's appeal of a lower court ruling that struck down a constitutional-based law banning abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. The case marks the first time the court will rule on the constitution constitutionality of a, uh, a pre-viability abortion ban since Roe v. Wade, which the court decided, as we also know, way back in 1973. The court's ruling in Roe recognized uh, that the decision whether to continue a pregnancy or to have an abortion uh, belongs to the individual, not to the government. With Dobbs, the state of Mississippi has asked the court both to uphold its abortion ban uh, and to overrule Roe uh, and find uh, that there is no constitutional right to abortion. Uh, now, the draft opinion, uh, which uh, you know, probably many of us have, have read completely, uh, raises a range of issues and so many questions, including what's next. Uh, to note one such question, uh, the court suggested uh, in the draft opinion that Dobbs stands out from other privacy cases uh, because in abortion involves a fetal life, uh, in the court's words. Uh, whereas other privacy cases do not. Um, but, um, but can or will that distinction uh, be a basis of the court's uh, further decisions in, in, in privacy cases that will surely come before it following Dobbs as states likely seek to curtail additional rights falling under the privacy umbrella. Uh, finally, uh, it is important to note that in these discussions about Dobbs, uh, and its implications, there is, of course, another side of the coin, uh, that being the passionately held views of those for whom there is no doubt that pre-viability fetuses are human life. Of course, the notion that life begins at conception versus the right of women, non-binary individuals, and trans men uh, to obtain an abortion is the clash of absolutes that defined, defines the d abortion debate. We have with us today a wonderful panel of scholars and experts, each of whom will speak for a few minutes uh, before addressing questions. Uh, they are, uh, and I'm going to inter uh, present them, introduce them in the order that they will speak, Professor Carolyn Shapiro, uh, who is the founder and co-director of Chicago Kent's Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States. Her scholarship is largely focused on the Supreme Court, its relationship to other courts and institutions, and its role in our constitutional democracy. She teaches classes in legislation and statutory interpretation, constitutional law, employment law, and public interest law and policy. From 2014 through mid-2016, Professor Shapiro took a leave of absence uh, from Chicago Kent to serve as Illinois Solicitor General. She has argued cases uh, in the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court, the Seventh Circuit, the Illinois Supreme Court, and the Illinois Appellate Courts. Professor Shapiro will discuss in her remarks uh, the leak of the draft opinion and reactions to it. Uh, Professor Steve Heyman is a leading First Amendment scholar who has written extensively on the foundations and limits of freedom of expression. His books include Free Speech and Human Dignity, Yale University Press, 2008, and a two-volume anthology entitled Hate Speech and the Constitution, Garland Rutledge, 1996. He has also written many law review articles on First Amendment topics, including hate speech, pornography, and, relig and religious freedom. In addition to the First Amendment, Professor Heyman's work explores many other aspects of constitutional law and legal philosophy, including affirmative rights, the meaning of the Second Amendment, whether there should be a legal duty to rescue, and the legal and political thought of Aristotle, Locke, and Hegel. 
Professor Heyman's comments will concern why the court should not confine the protections of the due process clause to rights that were recognized by the framers or that are deeply rooted in our history and tradition. Uh, professor Kathy Baker is a distinguished professor of law, a university distinguished professor of law, I should say. She is an expert in family law, particularly the modern law of marriage and parenthood, and she has written extensively on sexual violence and misconduct, especially in the lives of young adults. Her work focuses on the intersection of women's intimate lives and the law. Professor Baker's articles have been published in numerous top-ranked journals, and she is also the author of a casebook titled Family Law, The Essentials, with Catherine B. Silba and numerous book chapters. Professor Baker is a multiple award-winning teacher, having taught, among many other courses, family law, evidence, gender and the law, sexual orientation and the law, property, and numerous seminar seminars on feminism. In her remarks, Professor Baker will focus on uh, aspects of uh, discussions about contraceptions and uh, abortifacients uh, and abortion more generally. And then our finer spe final speaker will be Michelle Wetzel, uh, who is the general counsel of Planned Parenthood of Illinois, uh, which she joined uh, with a background in legal aid, health law, and nonprofit management. After working in legal aid at Prairie State Legal Services and the Legal Assistance Foundation for a decade, Michelle became the CEO of Bonaventure House, a supportive living facility for people living with HIV, AIDS, uh, and struggling with addiction or mental health issues. After that, um, uh, let's see, oh, I should say, under her leadership, uh, Bonaventure House uh, doubled its housing capacity as well as its budget. Uh, after that, Michelle became the first general counsel for Howard Brown Health, a federal qualified health center in Chicago. As part of the executive uh, leadership team there, she helped lead Howard, Howard Brown to a new era of growth and corporate responsibility. And after serving there for seven years, in 2019, uh, Michelle joined Planned, Her Planned Parenthood of Illinois. Uh, so with that, I invite Professor uh, Shapiro to begin. I'm going to talk about the leak itself and about what that tells us, uh, what we know today, and what we might expect. Um, and to start with, I think it's worth just saying a word about what is the process inside the court? So what, what is this leak of? What are we looking at? Uh, the process works like this. At, at, after oral argument, the justices meet in private conference. Nobody else is in the room, not even law clerks. They go around the room and they each say what they think about the case under the Chief, Chief Justice Rehnquist, it was a very short conversation. They would each basically say how they would rule and maybe a little bit about why, and then that would be that. Under Chief Justice Roberts, my understanding is that there's a little bit more discussion, but I don't know precisely how much. But it seems likely that during that conference, the justices indicated, the three liberals indicated that they would vote to, uh, to uh, affirm, that is to uh, affirm the lower court striking down of the Mississippi law, which was clearly unconstitutional, is clearly unconstitutional under current Supreme Court precedent, still today, um, that four, five justices said they wanted to overrule Roe and that the chief justice was wanted to do something in between. The normal process at that point is that the most senior justice in the majority assigns the opinion to another justice or to themselves in the majority. So if it's the chief justice is in the majority, he would be the one to assign the opinion. It's unclear what happens in a situation that I like the one I just described, which people presume is what the situation is, where the chief justice is going to ultimately agree to uphold the Mississippi law, but his reasoning, at least as we think articulated, um, and there are other leaks to support this speculation, 
uh, was not to go as far as the other justices, he might not have assigned the opinion, in which case it would have been assigned by Justice Thomas. Uh, at once the opinion is assigned, whoever gets the, that draft, the presumptive majority opinion, writes it up, circulates it to the court, uh, to all nine justices, and that's what we see. The, 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 what was leaked was that initial circulated draft. It clearly was written with the expectation that it would become a majority opinion. That doesn't necessarily mean that it, that it will, uh, and I'll say a minute, because sometimes uh, after a putative majority opinion is draft is circulated, justices either change their minds occasionally, the entire outcome flips very occasionally, but it does happen, uh, or justices might say, well, I don't think I can agree with all of your reasoning, so either I'm only gonna join part of the opinion or I'm not gonna join it at all, even though I agree with the bottom line. So we don't know yet what kind of conversations have happened in the court before the leak and whether or not and how the leak might affect those conversations. So I'll say a word about that in a second. So that's what we're looking at. We don't know anything about those, what's, wh what has happened. What we do know from another leak is that there have been no other opinions circulating yet in the court. Uh, and let me say we know. We've heard there, it has been reported that no other opinions have circulated yet, which means no concurrences, no dissents have yet circulated. That suggests to me that there is some behind the scenes discussion between the justices. Uh, the most likely, again, this has been reported as a leak, is that the Chief Justice is trying to persuade Justice Kavanaugh and or Justice Barrett not to join this Justice Alito's opinion, but instead to do something short of it. So that's the, that's the framework of what we're looking at. The, the fact of the leak itself is for anybody who follows the Supreme Court and for the court itself is really shocking. Uh, this has never happened before that a draft has leaked like this. There have been leaks about deliberations, about possible outcomes, but not of an, a full draft, and certainly in a case of this consequence and this magnitude. That is undoubtedly causing all kinds of problems within the court in terms of the relationships between justices and each other, between justices and their staff, between justices and other people's staff, right, the law clerks and other chambers. Justice Thomas uh, gave a speech just over the weekend that, that, uh, that alluded to that. Um, so it is, it is a really a totally unprecedented event and it, now I'm gonna offer my view about its likely effect, and then I'm gonna pass the baton. Nobody knows at this point who leaked it, uh, other than the people to whom it was leaked and the leaker themselves. Uh, you hear people on both sides of the aisle with their speculation about who leaked it, right? Conservatives tend to argue it must have been a liberal. Liberals uh, are more likely to say, no, it seems like it would be more likely a conservative. Um, in my view, the strategic reason to leak it makes more sense from the conservative perspective because I think the most likely effect of this leak is to short circuit any discussion that was happening behind the scenes and that it puts an enormous, you've all seen uh, the, foot, the footage and the coverage of those protests including protests outside the justices' homes, uh, whether or not that is uh, legal and I believe that it is, um, it will, in my view, it is, not, it is counterproductive, in my view, and therefore more likely to make the justices uh, stick with their original positions. So if I were worried about a justice leaving the putative majority, um, I would be more, right, that's why I think it's more likely to have been leaked um, by somebody on the right, but I wanna be clear, I am speculating, I do not know. And it could have been somebody on the left, and it could have been uh, somebody, it could have been actually sort of more, well, there are a lot of con conceivable scenarios. Uh, so that's where, that's what, that's what we're looking at, that's what we think we know so far about what's happening in the court, but we won't know absolutely for certain until the day they release the final opinion, which I expect will be sometime in June. So, um, 
in law school, uh, we spent a lot of time um, talking about judicial decisions. I never dreamed that we'd have the chance to pick apart a Supreme Court opinion before it was even handed down. Um, I, uh, I'd like to um, you know, spend my time um, just uh, briefly talking about the central reasoning in Justice Alito's draft. Um, so the, uh, the question in Dobbs is whether abortion should be regarded as a fundamental right under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. And uh, in recent decades, the justices have used um, actually two different competing approaches to determine whether a right is fundamental. So what you might call the liberal approach asks whether the right is essential for individual autonomy or dignity or privacy. And that's the approach that the court took in Roe and Casey. Um, Casey is the 1992 decision that uh, sort of reaffirmed uh, what they called the, the sort of central holding of Roe, um, that a woman had a right um, to decide whether to have an abortion before viability, um, um, and, uh, but at the same time sort of modified some of the, the rules coming out of Roe. Um, so, um, so that's the liberal approach. Um, by contrast, the conservative approach asks um, whether a particular right is deeply rooted in our nation's history and tradition. And that's the approach that Alito uses in Dobbs. Um, so he observes that under the common law, um, abortion was a criminal offense after quickening. That's not a term you hear very often um, these days, but it was the traditional term that referred to the point about midway through pregnancy when um, the woman could begin to discern fetal movement. So Alito says that um, at common law, it was a serious crime to abort after quickening. Um, he suggests that the, um, the common law frowned on abortion even before uh, quickening. Most importantly, he contends that by the time the 14th Amendment was adopted in 1868, that the great majority of American states had passed statutes that um, banned abortion at all stages of pregnancy. Um, and in much of the country, the law remained that way until Roe in 1973. So for these reasons, Alito concludes that abortion is not a fundamental right and that the states have broad authority to restrict it. Um, if you look at the scholarly literature um, and uh, the amicus briefs in the Dobbs case, then you'll see there's actually a good deal of debate about exactly what the historical situation was. Um, but um, still, I think it's fair to say that if one accepts the conservative approach to due process, the one that looks to history and tradition, then Alito makes a powerful case um, for his position. Uh, in my view, though, there are strong reasons to reject um, this conservative approach, and I want to just mention three of them now. Um, so the first point, of course, is that women weren't allowed to vote um, for the, um, the representatives who adopted the 14th Amendment um, or the people who passed the anti-abortion laws that were on the books then. Um, there were no women among the lawyers and judges who developed the traditional common law. And so it's not clear why history and tradition should be um, the standard for deciding what rights the Constitution affords to women or to other people who need re reproductive health care. Um, second, um, not surprisingly, um, the law that prevailed in the 19th century reflected what we would today consider to be outdated views about the status of women. Um, the movement to ban abortion, and I, I learned a lot about this just in the past week, um, a lot about the history. Um, the movement to ban abortion was actually led by the newly um, formed American Medical Association. Um, and one of their main arguments was that God and nature had ordained that the role of women was to be mothers. If you've um, taken constitutional law yet, then you know that under modern equal protection doctrine, laws can't be based on what the court um, calls archaic and stereotypical notions about the roles and abilities of males and females. So um, it seems to me these two points show that it's problematic for the court to use the conservative approach to due process, at least in cases that involve the rights of women um, or of other people who don't identify as male. Um, the third objection that I want to raise is a more general one, um, which is that the 14th Amendment wasn't about preserving history and tradition. The original Constitution, as you know, recognized and protected slavery. Uh, the Reconstruction Amendment sought to abolish that institution root and branch. Their goal was to protect the inherent freedom and equality of all persons, even those whose rights had not adequately been protected in the past. That's the very opposite of defining rights in terms of history and tradition. So, um, ironically, while Justice Alito adopts something like an originalist approach in Dobbs, I think he misunderstands the basic thrust 
of the 14th Amendment. What all of this means is that when we think about the issue of abortion, then I think we should go about it in a very different way than Alito does. One of the most basic aspects of freedom is the right to control your own body. Um, and more broadly, individuals have a right to self-determination. Um, that is, a right to determine um, the course of their lives. Um, these rights are clearly at stake in the abortion debate. The ultimate issue is how these rights should be reconciled with other values, um, like the protection of fetal life. Um, in Roe and Casey, um, the court, um, I think, did, it, did its best um, to strike a reasonable balance between the competing values. And, um, and I don't think anybody thinks that it's perfect, but, but that's what they were trying to do, was to strike some kind of balance. In Dobbs, on the other hand, the court is on the verge of abdicating its role in this area and of just leaving reproductive freedom to the mercy of state legislatures. Um, and in my view, that would be a huge step backward for constitutional freedom. And Good afternoon. Um, my name is Michelle Wetzel, as you heard. And I'm a general counsel, so I'm very practical in the kind of law that I practice. I'm not a constitutional scholar by any means, and I will leave that to the professors up here. Um, but I'm here to speak with you about the practical implications of what happens with uh, if Roe is actually overturned. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that Ro abortion is still legal, uh, Roe has not yet fallen, and our doors are open in Illinois uh, to receive abortion services. It's a very important message because uh, folks are hearing in the media that, ab that abortion is over and abortion is done, and women are very confused uh, around the country about whether they can receive abortion services or not. <clears throat> This is an unprecedented leak from the court, as you know. Uh, we in uh, the Planned Parenthood community are furious about the overturning of Roe and ignoring half a century of settled law that protected women and women's rights to choose. Whatever happens with Roe, abortion is and will remain safe and legal in Illinois. We're very fortunate to be in Illinois um, in this way. What we're expecting at Planned Parenthood of Illinois is that the states all around us will fall and uh, abortion will become unavailable to women in those, and, and persons with um, uteruses in the states around us. And that Illinois will be flooded with women who need abortion uh, services. Uh, we're prepared for that. We're working very, very hard to uh, expand our services, expand our, uh, uh, um, expand our access for um, service, abortion services at all of our sites. We have 17 health centers throughout the state. We're juggling schedules, we're broadening schedules, we're bringing in new providers, we're preparing um, so that we can serve the women from across the country who will come to us. We already, each month since the uh, Texas SB8, past have seen more women from out of state than we've ever seen before. And we expect that to just increase. In order to see more abortion patients, um, we will probably have to uh, decrease some of our family planning services. And we will work with the states who have gone dark to provide those family planning services for us through telemedicine so that those women will still be able to be served with the family planning needs that they have and will free us up to provide the abortion that only we'll be able to do. Some people uh, think that abortion is all Planned Parenthood does. And in fact, we uh, do family planning, as I just mentioned, STI exams and treatment, UTI treatments, uh, pap tests, vasect vasectomies, breast exams, HIV testing, and gender affirming hormone therapy. Most folks don't realize that. Um, we I formerly worked at Howard Brown Health Center, and between the two of us, Howard Brown and Planned Parenthood, we provide the majority of the gender-affirming hormone therapies in the state of Illinois. We've built a new health center um, near Wisconsin border. We've built a new health center near the Indiana border. We've expanded our um, health center in the loop. And as I said, we're expanding our services at our central Illinois health centers as well in order to um, meet this demand that's coming. 
We've expanded telehealth offerings. And just recently, we've started our direct to patient uh, services, which is receiving um, abortion uh, medication in the mail. I um, expect you'll have questions for me when we get to that part, but I'll leave it there for the moment. Thanks for your attention. Okay, so um, I'm not going to talk about the law at all, um, mostly because the people up here know more about constitutional law than I do, um, but also because I'm not very optimistic that um, people who are concerned about reproductive autonomy, uh, that the law is the right thing to be thinking about. Um, I think we're going to lose for the foreseeable future. Um, so I want to um, talk about uh, other stuff, probably broadly under the umbrella of politics, that um, where, where we can focus our energies. Um, but I want to start out with a story. Um, and I want to um, start my story with a trigger warning, because um, there are people who think the story I'm about to tell is murder. And I suspect that if you think of it as murder, it would be very disquieting and uncomfortable to hear the story I'm about to tell with the callousness I'm about to tell it. Um, so if you feel the need to get up and leave, I completely understand and I won't be offended. Um, but I think it's really important to tell because I think that in part the discomfort that we know people feel has kept women like me from talking. And um, I don't think we can afford that luxury anymore. So, uh, so I had an abortion when I was 41 years old. I was already a mother of a three-year-old, and I very much wanted a second child. And um, as most of you probably know, it becomes increasingly difficult to get pregnant and carry a pregnancy to term the older you get, exponentially so, after age 40. Um, and that's both because eggs become less receptive to sperm and because the genetic material inside ova degenerates over time. If you're born with eggs, you're born with all the eggs you're ever going to have. And the longer they stay in the fridge, the more likely they are to go bad. Um, and it was because of, I was lucky enough to get pregnant at 41. And um, because of that problem with um, chromosomal uh, development, we got genetic testing. And it came back when I was 11 and a half weeks pregnant. And it had something called trisomy 18 throughout the cells. Um, and the doctors told me that I had a 75% chance of miscarrying late in the second trimester or early in the third trimester, and that if a child was born, it had a 95% chance of dying in the first three weeks. Um, and of course, if I waited that out, I would be putting in jeopardy my chance of getting pregnant again because I was getting exponentially more difficult for me to bear another child. Um, so I terminated. And not that the trimester framework is relevant to much, but to just sort of put it in some context. I, I made it just within the first trimester, but like if I'd been traveling when I got my genetic test, or if I'd been away somewhere when the results came back, I wouldn't have made it inside the first trimester, right? So if some state puts a cutoff then, like I wouldn't have made it. Um, for those of you who want to know, uh, I was lucky enough to get pregnant again. I have at home a six foot tall, in equal measure, obnoxious and hilarious 17 year old son. Um, and um, notwithstanding Justice Kennedy's language in Carhartt, I have absolutely no regrets about what I did. Um, but I also understand that someone can hear that story and think, who does she think she is? She had all the privilege in the world. I had health insurance. I had a ridiculously stable job, right? I could have handled whatever happened. I already had a perfectly healthy kid. Who was I to play God? I don't agree with that, but I don't know it's wrong because I don't think there is a right and wrong. And I think politically what we need to to learn to do is to live in a culture where people can hold both of those beliefs. And I think that's actually the responsibility of all sides here, um, is to try and figure out a way to be together as one in a culture with those very, very different beliefs. Um, for what it's worth, I think when it sort of comes down to the ultimate decision, um, I don't think the decision I made is as a ridiculously privileged white cisgender married mother um, is very different than a decision that a 
marginally employed, petrified, 17-year-old woman of color makes. And it goes something like this. I really, 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 really don't want to do this. And I don't think that anybody else has the right to compel me to put my body in service to the creation of a life that I don't want to create. But if you believe, for instance, that God created that life, that reasoning doesn't hold. OK, so now I want to pivot and talk about pills. Um, first pills I want to talk about are birth control pills, though actually any kind of birth control, the more the better. Um, absolutely. I was a little bit disappointed on Saturday when I was listening to um, interviews with some people at the marches who said, I don't want to talk about birth control. I have a right to abortion regardless of birth control. And I don't disagree with that, but I don't think that's the right political posture. I think this has to be a and both all the way kind of thing politically. Nothing predicts abortion rate as accurately as contraception rate. You know what doesn't predict abortion rate? Stringency of abortion laws. Central America, very strict abortion laws, very high abortion rate. Western Europe, very lax abortion laws, very low abortion rate. What's the difference? Contraception rate. Contraception rate, like almost everything else in this country, is deeply classed. Middle and upper class people use contraception. A lot of low-income people don't. Interestingly, the one time the contraception rate ticked up significantly over the last 20 years was when the Affordable Care Act covered um, birth control. Um, and so the people in the majority opinion in Hobby Lobby, I know a bunch of you first years, you might not have read it yet, but for, for those of you who know, the people who wrote the majority opinion in Hobby Lobby are kind of directly responsible for the number of, of abortions that happened because people couldn't get access to birth control. Um, I, this is tricky, and this is something white feminists have failed abysmally at over the last 30 years, but I think that there is a lot of important intersexual, intersectional work that has to be done around the culture of not contracepting. Some of it, as I just suggested, is economic, but some of it isn't. Um, and I think that we should be, I mean, if we can't get the federal government to fund it, that we should be getting private sources in to fund more birth control. If Planned Parenthood is having to send people who want contraception in Illinois to telehealth in Indiana, we should be supporting that. I think we should be putting free birth control clinics in every Walmart parking lot in a red state. I just think we should be talking about it all the time. Um, and because in part, the more we talk about it, the more we normalize it, the more it becomes clear that, and okay for women to feel empowered. I think that still, ultimately, a lot of the decisions not to contracept have to do with gender dynamics between a couple. Um, and I think we need to do a lot of hard work around empowering women to say no unless she has contraception. Okay, last thing I wanna talk about is the pills that more people are talking about, which is um, the, uh, the pills used in medical abortions. Um, so the FDA has approved this two pill treatment uh, that's misoprostol, and I have to, I always mispronounce them, uh, mifoprostone. Um, mifoprostone is expensive to make, and the two together are the safest, most effective way to do it, but here's the thing. Misoprostol is really cheap, and it's still 90% effective, and it's made all over the world, and all you really need to get it is a debit card and access to the internet and a snail mail address and a little box arrives with your pills. Is it the safest thing to do? No. Are, is anyone gonna be able to control it? No. Look at what happens with opioids. We, like, we, just, we don't know how to control that kind of market. Um, and this is largely what happens in places like Central America. One in three pregnancies in Central America ends in abortion and the vast majority of them um, end in abortion through misoprostol. But again, I think that there's stuff we can do to help there. Um, I, for instance, think that um, perfectly reputable websites, you know, Mayo Clinic, UCLA Med Centers, Mount Sinai, University of Chicago Hospitals, I think there should be prominent links on those websites saying, medical abortion, safe, this is how you do it. And the first line will inevitably be, you should do this under control and care with a doctor, right? But but if you're in Texas and you're reading that, you're like, I can't do that because they'd throw the doctor in jail. So what do I do, right? And I mean, 
you can learn how to buy a bomb on the internet. I mean, how to make a bomb on videos on the internet. Don't we think that we can teach people how to take the pills in a manner that's basically safe so they know what they're doing? It would be gross, and again, often we don't talk about this stuff because it's gross, but that has been to our detriment, right? This is the amount you're supposed to bleed. If this isn't happening, you take another pill. You should lose this much blood over the course of 12 hours. You should lose this much blood over the course of 24, and this is when you go to the hospital. Right? But if that was there and prominent and everyone had access to those kind of videos, the other side isn't going to be able to stop what's going to happen. And I think that ultimately making what's going on in women's lives obvious is going to be more effective than making legal arguments to people who fundamentally believe um, that this is murder. Uh, we are now going to address questions, and I want to start with a few that were submitted online uh, beforehand, uh, which may mirror some of the questions that you have in mind. So the first one that I'm going to ask is a combination, really, of two questions, two rather similar questions uh, that we received, uh, that being, uh, let me take my mask off. Uh, to what extent do you think that uh, dogs would endanger other unenumerated rights that the court has recognized in the past, such as the, the rights uh, to use uh, uh, contraception um, and to uh, and same-sex marriage? And I'll, you know, anyone that would like to answer, feel free. So I, I think the, the opinion, the draft opinion goes out of its way to say, oh, no, 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 it's doesn't, not going to affect those those rights, uh, and the reason is the reason that Professor Heyman said that there is a, a, a fetal life at stake when it comes to abortion and not in these other contexts. The problem is the opinion also says some other things that, uh, m that points out the ways in which these rights are very comparable. Uh, the opinion, when it talks about this uh, deeply rooted in history and tradition test, it identifies these cases. The, the the cases about contraception, the cases about same-sex sexuality, about same-sex marriage, as cases that did not respect that deeply rooted history and tradition test and therefore went too far in identifying rights under this right to privacy. So the opinion can say, no, 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 they're different, but it sets up a set of extremely obvious arguments for why they should be treated the same. It may be that some, that Justice Alito and or the justices who may be, may or may not join his opinion, don't, genuinely don't think that those other cases are in danger or those other rights are in danger. But I think it, that it is not something that can be predicted that easily. Uh, one analogy I've heard is it's like a tapestry or a sweater and you pull on a thread and you don't know what's gonna happen. Another argument I've heard that I think makes a lot of sense is that it's not entirely up to the Supreme Court. It's up to the legislatures in other states, in red states, that are, gonna, that are already passing uh, pretty extreme laws or taking other actions. Uh, the governor of Texas is, is taking some action related to same-sex marriage, for example, that will set up litigation and there are very conservative members of the judiciary who, at least in some instances, are going to agree that the logic of the Dobbs opinion, should that become the majority opinion, means that these other rights can't be supported either. And by the time those cases get to the Supreme Court, the window of, appropriate, of what's understood to be normal arguments, acceptable arguments, will have shifted. So I think it's not it's not that I necessarily think, I think the original version of this question, one version of this question that came in online, it suggested, are the justices being dishonest? I don't know. They might not be. They might think this. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but I don't think it's very meaningful one way or the other. I, I, uh, I agree with Professor Shapiro that we don't really know what the, um, what the result is going to be. Um, um, and. I guess I would add that, that when Justice Alito says that there's nothing in, in the Dobbs opinion that in any way undermines 
um, the, the, um, these other decisions. Um, that, that's not the same thing as reaffirming those decisions, right? He's not coming out and saying, and, and these decisions are right and we adhere to them and so forth. So I think it's fair to say that, that at least this draft is kind of neutral um, on those other you know, cases and whether they would remain good law or not. Um, so uh, um, I, I think Professor Shapiro has given you know, a couple of reasons for concern about this. Let me just say one or two things on, on the other side, um, the one legal and, and sort of one practical. Um, so from a legal standpoint, um, I think it's completely true that, um, that if the court were to continue to use this history and tradition test, um, then it would not have reached the results that it did um, in, in Obergefell, at least, on, on same-sex marriage. Um, and, um, and one way that we know this is that the Obergefell was a five to four decision and, um, and the four dissenters used exactly this test and they said this is not deeply rooted. Um, so, um, so I think we know that they would not have decided um, the, the case that way in the first instance, but we really knew that anyway, right, given the current composition of the court. Um, and also it seems um, sort of much less likely than in the future um, if they use this test. Um, that they would be recognizing new rights. In terms of, though, what happens with Griswold, which um, found a right to contraception, or Obergefell, um, a right to same-sex marriage, um, from a legal standpoint, it would then come down to the question of stare decisis. Um, that is, whether the court will um, you know, respect precedent and leave those um, decisions standing, even though maybe um, a, the current majority of the court would not have ruled that way in the first instance. Um, and, and here, I think that there's you know, some... Um, some room for hope um, with, regard, in, with regard to Obergefell, um, the, um, the reliance interests are, are huge, um, whereas uh, in Dobbs, uh, Alito insists that, that there's not much reliance on a right to abortion um, because you can just change your kind of contraceptive or reproductive planning after the decision, decision comes down. Um, I, there, there are something like 1.5 million uh, people who are in same-sex marriages in the United States today. Um, something like half a million of those marriages took place um, just in the seven years since Obergefell. Um, I think it would be unthinkable for the Supreme Court to, to say that uh, a state would be able to just say, poof, you're not married anymore, sort of just wipe out um, somebody's marriage. Um, and, um, and even to, to, for the court to say that going forward, a state could prohibit same-sex marriage, it would create all sort of incredible messes of a sort that Professor Baker could tell you about in, in, in great detail. Um, so I think there's a very strong reliance interest um, in terms of, of, um, of you know, continuing with the Obergefell um, decision. And with regard to contraception, um, there I think that, that the, um, the court would not be able to say what it says here in Dobbs, um, which is that there's this kind of you know, deep, profound moral issue that the country is divided about right down the middle. That's just not true with regard to contraception. There's an, only a very small number of people who have deep moral objections um, to contraception. Um, so I think that, that it's unlikely that anytime soon the court is likely to make a kind of direct attack um, on those two precedents. I think more likely what we're looking at would be chipping away um, at them. Um, if, uh, if a state legislature tried to, to ban um, the morning after pill, um, right, or to ban IUDs um, on the grounds that, that, um, that the legislature considers them to, um, to possibly have an abortifacient effect, um, then, um, then we'd have to see whether a court would say, well, that's more like abortion, and so the state can regulate, or it's more like contraception, and so that they can. And with regard to same-sex marriage, um, similarly, um, you could imagine states um, sort of um, cutting back on sort of related rights like adoption and, and so forth for same-sex couples. And I, I wouldn't be confident about what the Supreme Court would do about those. But, but I, I do think that it's, it's unlikely anytime soon that the court would be um, simply overruling those um, previous precedents. Um, and and here's, um, here's the practical point, um, which is that um, the, uh, the justices in Dobbs um, in the draft, they, they sort of talk as though they're going to wash their hands of the abortion issue and they're never going to have to address it again. Um, and there's a wonderful article in the Columbia Law Review coming out um, by um, David Cohen and two co-authors um, that show that that's the furthest thing from the truth, that the court is going to have one abortion case after another coming before it because of these interjurisdictional 
conflicts with um, with some states, um, maybe like Texas, um, trying to or, or Missouri, trying to prevent their citizens from leaving the state to get abortions in Illinois, and then states like Illinois or Connecticut or California um, taking aggressive steps to try to protect the ability of people to come and do that. The court is gonna see so many abortion cases um, dealing with that, um, that I don't think that they're gonna have the, uh, the sort of bandwidth um, or political capital um, to be mounting an assault on some of these uh, other privacy cases. One other thing, I think that, sorry, uh, I think that's an inevitable is that um, though Texas is like banning all abortions right now, that's not going to last, right? There's going to all the states that are banning it are going to need to set up an adjudicatory mechanism for situations when the mother's life is really at risk, or else, right, someone's actually going to die, and that's not going to go over well politically. Um, and right, that adjudicatory mechanism, what it's, what's it going to be, how it's going to be, right? If if that's too strict, is that actually forcing someone to die? I don't think that I don't think those decisions evade Supreme Court review. Uh, another question that we received online, and I'll, um, I'll share this one, and that I think we might uh, want to, I do want to see whether there's some questions from those in the audience. Uh, this question is, why do you think the stronger effort has been made for preserving nationwide abortion protection and not for stronger paternal accountability and child care for struggling parents? I'm the family law person, so I'm going to take that. Um, uh, so, so here's some um, statistics. Most of the child support that gets paid in this country gets paid voluntarily, and the majority of child support that doesn't get paid doesn't get paid because men don't have the money. Um, the vast majority of child support that's in arrears, of people that are in arrears on their child support, um, are very low-income men. Um, there has been a, several reputable studies that suggest that the money we put into enforcement of child support would actually be much better spent on um, direct expenditure for the children because it would actually get to them. Um, for low-income men, we've created this kind of um, incredibly counterproductive process um, whereby we sue them for child support and they don't have it and so we take away their license for instance and then they don't have a car to be able to get to their job or we throw them in jail um, which of course significantly inhibits their ability to make money in the future um, so to the extent that people think and I, I guess I should have prefaced this with this um, the to the extent that these laws are gonna mean that more people end up having children that they don't want. Those children are gonna be wildly disproportionately raised in poverty, like all of the statistics show that. Um, and child support isn't gonna help that um, because to the extent we hold the genetic father responsible, the, those genetic fathers don't have the money to lift those children out of poverty. To the extent the question was about why haven't we spent more money on childcare and other kinds of services to help low-income people that are raising children, I don't, I mean, the answer to that question, I guess, is political. That, that there is a significant disconnect between um, the, the concern that a lot of people show for the unborn child and then the child once born. I want to open it up to questions um, from the audience, uh, if, if anyone has one. Yeah, Joan. Yeah. If I might, uh, might you be able to repeat the question for the recording? Um, yeah, uh, so, uh, so Professor Steinman's question is, um, has to do with these interjurisdictional um, conflicts. Um, so, um, so a woman's home state tries to prevent her from going out of state to get an abortion or, uh, or tries to punish um, abortion providers who, who might be helping her. Um, and, um, and Professor Steinman's question is, um, <laughs> um, it is, you know, do we have an initial take about the constitutionality um, of that? Um, so I'll just, I'll just say um, I, I don't. Um, I, um, my, at first blush, I, I would have thought that, um, that it would be very clear that under the Constitution you have a right to travel, 
um, from one state to another, and that while you're in the other state, um, then you would have a right to do anything that you were lawfully permitted to do in that state, and that the notion that your home state could uh, impose punishment either on you or on the out-of-state provider um, was completely inconsistent with, you know, with our sort of federalist system. Um, but, um, but it turns out that, that A, there's, there's like virtually no law um, on the subject, and that um, you know that there's some leading scholars who who disagree about this and who take uh, sort of opposing positions about it. Um, and um, and I think to really think through this issue, we'd have to to sort of think of other kinds of situations in which the same issue might arise. You know, also. And so um, I guess in a situation like this probably my first inclination would be to go to you, Joan, and ask if you had any initial view about this, um, because um, I, I, I really, as far as I know, this is kind of terra incognita. Can I just say that, practically speaking, um, we're concerned in Illinois about this issue and are working uh, to work with the legislative process in Illinois to protect our providers. Uh, we think that it'll be challenged. There will be lawsuits, and it's uncharted territory, um, and we're, con we're concerned, but it won't stop us. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Thank you, and let me repeat the question. This is actually one that we received also online, or a similar question. Uh, we, is, um, you know, can uh, Congress pass legislation um, to protect abortion rights or similarly to, to, to ban rights and uh, could they do so under uh, the either the Commerce Clause or the 14th Amendment? I think the answer to that question is uh, slightly complicated in the sense that there's is the law today and what I think might happen to the law uh, as things hap as if Congress acts. Under the law today, no question that the um, Congress could certainly pass a law says that uh, the abortion pills and IUDs and such items are legal, uh, and that no st and that preempts any state making them illegal. Uh, that that's pretty straightforward. Uh, if if there was a challenge to that, uh, it start to look like a, it might one version of the challenge might be. A challenge that says that that claims that a, a person under the Fourteenth Amendment and that that therefore con that, that limits congressional power, or well, I guess it wouldn't limit Congress, but it would, it would be also be under the Fifth Amendment. Um, similarly, Congress could try to pass a law that simply tries to codify Roe. I think likely to be found unconstitutional under the Commerce Power. Uh, I think the opposite would be true if Congress passed a law that banned nationwide. I think that this court would say that was perfectly fine under the commerce power, even though I don't think logically there's any difference. Um, and that the I think the Supreme Court is very unlikely to say that the Fourteenth Amendment. This Supreme Court is very unlikely to say the Fourteenth Amendment gives Congress the power to codify Roe because, assuming Roe is overruled. The right to abortion is no longer a, a core right within the amendment, and therefore, Congress, when it uses its enforcement power under the 14th Amendment, Section 5 power, can't expand the scope of the 14th Amendment and would not, therefore, be able to grant rights, the right to obtain an abortion uh, that is not otherwise protected by the 14th Amendment. That may be a little convoluted, especially for those of you who haven't taken con law or haven't taken it recently. Um, but the, the Congress has been, the court has been very stingy for a long time in terms of allowing Congress to act pursuant to the 14th Amendment, and I don't think this would be any different. I, uh, I agree with Professor Shapiro about the, the 14th Amendment. Um, and, and actually, this is, uh, this is a way in which the, the Dobbs opinion is kind of surprisingly, you know, more moderate than you might think, um, because there were some amicus briefs that urged the Supreme Court to say that a fetus was a person under the 14th Amendment, and therefore that states um, had an obligation um, to ban abortion. And that's not at all what this draft says. It, it says it's completely up to the states to decide either to permit it 
uh, or to forbid it. Um, that does so. I, I agree with Professor Shapiro that the Fourteenth Amendment is just kind of out of the picture um, at this point. Um, if if the case comes down as we expect, um, I would disagree just a little with regard to the Commerce Clause. Um, I think that under current doctrine, Congress would have the power um, to um, to just legalize abortion um, throughout the country under the Commerce Clause on the grounds that um, that. Um, um, abortion involves a tremendous amount of economic activity and also um, has tremendous economic repercussions of the kind that Professor Baker uh, was talking about. Um, so uh, under current doctrine, I think that Congress could make abortion um, permissible throughout the country under the Commerce Clause and equally um, could make it impermissible under the Commerce Clause. Um, the real problem is, um, is a practical um, political one, which is that um, unless you abolish the filibuster in the Senate, um, there's no way to pass a law um, protecting abortion rights at the moment, and that's just what happened um, you know, just, um, just last week uh, when the, the, the Senate voted um, on this. All right, great, thanks so much. Well, I see we are pretty much right at 3 p.m. Uh, so I think this will conclude our panel discussion, and I very much want to thank the panelists uh, for participating today and all of you for attending and, and asking, uh, whether online or, or here, great questions. So thanks so much. Thank you.